If you guys want me to cover more tracks that I did with Ludd and Schlatt, feel free to let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll make some other videos about it. Many months later. Alright. Worm. <laughs> You ready for me to look big stupid again? You you ready to edit big stupid? I'm big stupid. No, now you can clip that. Okay. I've been gone a couple of months. I know. I know I've been slacking on the content, but but there's a really good reason for that. I'm going to show you. Listen, I'm going to show you. No, no, I'm going to show you. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. All right. So this is my bubba girl. Her name's Miss Daisy. Daisy Do. She is the love of my life. We got her at the end of October. And we got her at nine weeks. And she's been my baby. Daisy, do you have anything to say to the camera? But yeah, one day she's going to be big studio dog. And we've been spending a lot of time <laughs> raising her. <laughs> so that's why I've been gone for a while. I'm going to go put her down. Okay. I put her down, but she did not die. That I did not mean it that way. Do not. Anyways, <laughs> I've been gone for a while and I still, I owe you guys a video where I show you all the tips and tricks that I use during Ludwig and Schlatt's Music Emporium. And so I wanted to get into how I got such a small orchestra that we recorded with to sound like these gargantuan sized, like full orchestra pieces that you guys heard and you guys are probably using in your YouTube videos. And these are tricks that you can use to make one person in a recording room sound like a whole choir. So I thought that would be a cool thing to show you guys. All right, so the first track that I pulled up is the Romeo and Juliet Fantasy Overture from Tchaikovsky, which is such an iconic piece that I was so excited to be able to record this. Um, if you're looking at the project now, it probably doesn't look like there's that much going on. But when you look inside these package folders, these are all of the combined takes that I had just for the string section that I used. Here's the brass, the woodwinds, and here are some other stems. So I'll just play a little bit of it. You get the idea. First thing I want to mention, for the producers out there, you probably notice that not all of the tracks that I used are live instruments, and that is 100% correct. I can't hire a full like 90 piece orchestra, you know how much money that would cost? So the best route is to take a handful of live instruments. And those are all the guys that are in blue here. These are all the audio tracks. And use them at the forefront, but in the background, tucked underneath, you have MIDI instruments, fake instruments. They're, that's what's called like you produce in box. Um, and you have those tucked underneath just because it's going to give so much more depth and so much more power to the orchestra that you are trying to create. So if I just single out the main two French horn mics, that obviously doesn't give you a lot of sound, right? Even when you add the stereo mics that we had going on, so those are these guys. Here's some, here is with both sets of stereo mics that we had, right? And that still wasn't enough for me. So what I ended up doing was I tucked these guys in. And you can barely hear it. It's so quiet. And that's, but it just gives it a little bit more emphasis, which is what I thought the horn section needed at that point. What libraries did I use? I would really recommend Spitfire libraries. So this is what I used for the French horns. Um, and the cool thing about 
this library is you're able to adjust articulation. There is a wheel at the bottom where basically you can input different notes if you want them to be to change the notes from staccato to legato and you can adjust things on the right here like the dynamics the release time variation in the notes that are used um, it just allows for a lot of customization which is really useful for a composer that needs to use these on a variety of different soundtracks or a variety of different feelings and another another really nice thing about the Spitfire libraries is over here in like the easy mix section, there is an option to place how far away the player sounds in the orchestra, which allows me as the producer and the mixer of the project to be able to fill the space that I wanna create. Um, a really important lesson when you are mixing a project is you have to think about where all the players are in the space in which you're trying to create. Having the ability to move the distance of how these MIDI instruments feel, either closer or further back in a mix, it allows me to create a space that is more appropriate for various settings. So when I'm recording these huge orchestral pieces like Tchaikovsky, where there is a 90 piece orchestra and it is on a huge orchestral stage, it really allows me to be able to tuck these instruments way in the back because brass players and horn players are usually seated towards the back of the orchestra um, and allows me to fill in that space that I am fabricating. Because obviously, if you have seen any of the footage from when we recorded, we recorded in a much smaller hall compared to a full orchestral stage. So that's why I like using the symphonic brass from Spitfire. One other thing to note for a lot of the audio tracks, you're gonna notice I don't really have in the audio effects chain, I don't really have that much going on. The reason for that is because when we were recording in the studio, we had built-in EQs and built-in pre-delays, compression, that we adjusted the settings for on the actual consoles that were at the studio. And so, you know, we had the we had the audio sounding exactly how we wanted to coming in. And because of that, I didn't feel the need to fiddle around with like EQing or compression of any of these audio tracks, which is great. One thing that's kind of common in um, in the producer space is that people think the the longer the audio effect chain that you have the more plugins you use the better the track is going to sound and really all that matters at the end of the day is if it sounds good to your ears then it's probably fine and you'll see that in all of these orchestral things that i am doing because if you make sure that the mics are placed really carefully and that the compression and EQ that's going into your DAW is how you want it to sound, then you don't really need a lot of extra work inside the DAW to make it sound like a polished product. So another reason why I have a lot of MIDI for the brass specifically is because uh, even though the players were fantastic, there were just some timing things that were an issue and you know you can see that if i like pull out the flex timing you'll see that this measure alone i did a lot of surgery on to just the timing to be able to line up with the rest of the orchestra uh, and so another technique that you can use to mask mistakes in your live recordings is to put midi beneath it where the midi instruments are playing it perfectly in time exactly how it's intended to sound so if I pull out all of the brass here, like so, and play this,
They sound great, but you can tell just in this measure alone that even the best takes that I use didn't really line up with each other. So that's why when you add in all these MIDI instruments, you'll hear you'll hear that it helps to cover up the timing discrepancies that occur during the live recording and then when you put that with the full orchestra in <laughs> can't even tell that the brass were a little off time. So there's a little trick. I lightly talked about positioning the players in the space that you are trying to create. And along with that comes panning. So if you look at all the instruments, I'll unpack them. They're all spaced in different directions, in different places in the mix. Now, the reason why that's really important is because if you picture yourself sitting down in an orchestra concert, if you have every single track lined directly in the middle, that means the same thing as if you are sitting in a concert and every single player is sitting on top of each other, playing at you from the same direction. Now that's not gonna get you the sound of a 90 piece orchestra. So a really important technique is doing what I did here and panning things in the areas in which those instruments normally sit in an orchestral setting. There are multiple different placements that depending on the size of the orchestra, the instrumentation, um, there are multiple options in how you can set up an orchestra floor. But in general, you usually have first violins sitting all the way on the left, second violins, and then you slowly move across the orchestra from highest sounding to lowest sounding. Something important to note is we didn't have a 90 piece orchestra come and record, right? We had a string section, we had a brass section and a woodwind section. And so in order to make this sound big enough to be a 90 piece orchestra. What we did during the recording session is we would record different sections, get through the entire piece, and then we would come back. We would choose the best takes that we did throughout. And we would put that into the player's ears so that they could hear that. And they would record, we would record an additional take of them playing on top of the audio that they had already recorded. So I'll show you in a second why that makes such a big difference. So just the strings alone, I muted all the doubles that I ended up using and let's play from a section where everybody is playing their hearts out, right? So let's just play from here. <laughs> That sounds great, but I'm going to unmute the doubles that I added and we'll listen and we can compare. So here is that same exact section with the doubles added in. So you can hear the difference. It sounds so much fuller. And 
we had to do that in order to make these pieces work because these pieces involve so many players and we just don't have the massive budget to be able to make that happen and the recording space that I have can't fit that many people. So this is how we were able to navigate around that. Another thing that you might notice when you're looking at all these tracks is that the volume of all of them vary pretty drastically, right? And the reason for that is not only am I adjusting the volume of specific tracks throughout, but the balance in the orchestra is really important. A disadvantage of recording the way that we did is we had to record each family of instruments separately. So we recorded the brass in a separate section from the woodwinds in a separate section from the strings. And because of that, there are balance levels that become an issue if you put all of those instruments playing at the volume that they did in the track and just didn't adjust anything. So the way that you navigate around that is for me, I usually start with the strings and I'll start with the stereo doubles. So what the stereo mixes are, or what the stereo mics are is they record the overall sound of all the instruments that are playing at that time, right? So you'll hear all the instruments happening at the same time. Now, after that, once I have the stereos adjusted to the level that I want them to be at, What I started doing after that is I would bring in section by section, instrument by instrument, and I would start their volume all the way down. And I would slowly drag them up until I felt like that they were at an appropriate volume in the mix to where they are contributing but not being too loud. Now, what does that mean, right? So what that means for, what that means for me is in these pieces where I wanted to make a large orchestra and I wanted it to sound like it was in an orchestral hall, the reason why I'm slowly bringing in all of these individual tracks of the solo instruments, their mics are placed right in front of their instrument. And so if I am trying to create what it sounds like to hear this piece from the perspective of someone sitting in the audience, you're, you as an audience listener are not gonna hear the violin this far away from your face, right? Which is what all of these tracks are doing. These tracks are mic'd super close to the instruments so that they get a really clear and crisp sound. What you're gonna hear more of is, are these stereo mics? Because they're placed further back and they're getting an overall sound rather than a close-up sound of just the instruments, you know? Something that comes with close-up mics are the sound of the bow actually hitting a string. You hear from woodwind and brass players, you hear breaths more. You, you might even hear for instruments that have a lot of keys, like an oboe or bassoon, you might hear like the clickiness that comes with those keys. And that's not something as an audience member that you would here in any situation ever because you're just too far away. And so that's why you, what I usually do with these, when I'm mixing these types of projects is I will start the individual instruments at like negative infinity and I will slowly drag them until I hear their presence, but it doesn't feel like the mix is close to you is in your face. I still want it to feel like that you are sitting in the audience and this orchestra is performing on stage. So that's why you'll notice that all these instruments, depending on what their role is in the piece, are adjusted to different volume levels. Um, I will say that for the woodwind tracks, you'll hear that their volume is actually pretty high for a lot of them. And the reason is because when it comes to woodwinds, even in a full orchestra of like 90 people, there's 
still only one first oboe. There's still only two to three at max second oboes. Um, and because of that, the woodwinds just need more support from their close-up mics in order to be able to compete with the sound of the brass. One last thing that I want to note about this piece before moving on is not every instrument that are in all these pieces are real instruments. And I talked about that with the brass and having um, some MIDI brass instruments in there, but something that you might not know is that anytime you hear any percussion track from Ludenschlatt's Musical Emporium that is classical music, all of the percussion is fake. So you can listen to that right here. I'll just I'll just play the full track. the idea. The reason why I was able to get away with using MIDI percussion is because for the snippets that we used of these iconic classical pieces, percussion really isn't the main focal point of those sections. Usually it's either woodwind solos or beautiful strings or a full orchestra sound where in those instances the percussion is usually a supporting role that tucks underneath to help get the feeling across. So uh, in, in Romeo and Juliet, all that's there is a timpani and a cymbal. And that's what that sounds like. Yeah. And something like that, it's so minor that and it's tucked so far back if you if we want to talk about positioning again the timpani in an orchestra is all the way in the back right and so you could probably hear from what i just played that sample sounds really tucked back and that's another way that i'm kind of able to get away with using a fake instrument for that um and same thing with the cymbal this is probably such a small detail that you were fairly even able to hear in the full production. And because of that, as long as I adjust the timing, the volume, and the expression and modulation of these instruments to feel human, nobody would ever guess that they were MIDI instruments. So I brought up expression and modulation really briefly, and you might be wondering, what does that even mean? So most MIDI instruments that you'll see producers using have these functions, and basically, what expression and modulation do, they are two different channel controls that allow you to customize both the volume and the intensity of how these instruments are being played. So if you watch as I'm playing this timpani, you'll see that the dynamics slowly rise up, right? And that a couple of these knobs over here adjust as well. So that's what allows me to create the crescendo that that timpani has throughout those measures because I wrote in to start pretty quietly and, and then I wrote in, okay, as we get through this measure, I want the timpani sound to not only be louder, but I want it to feel more intense. I want the hits themselves to actually be harder because there's a difference between taking 
like a smooth hitting mallet sound and turning the volume up on that a lot versus taking a hard hitting mallet sound and putting that in your mix. And so not only is the volume increasing, but the way that they're hitting the timpani is also becoming more intense as well. If you're trying to create MIDI instruments that have an organic feeling to them, that is a really important skill to master just because that is what gives any fake instrument a human aspect to it. All right, so if you want more tips or tricks on how to work with string orchestras, if you want production tricks, if you want composition tricks, be sure to follow all my social links below because I plan on making much, much more content, I promise. Pinky promise, look. A pinky promise. That was lame as fuck. To anybody that made it to the end of the video, I'm so thankful that you are watching my content. You know, even though I'm a really small creator, I plan on doing really big things one day. And so I really hope you stick along for the ride. I also just released my first single a few weeks ago. It's on all streaming platforms. Be sure to check it out. I am, I'm saying this on the internet, so it'll be true. I, my goal is to release a single every two to three months. So after I release this video, if there is not a new single by Philman that is out in two to three months, come bully me. And if you want to follow Daisy Social, we're trying to get her to 10K so that we can have her pay for her own dog food. <laughs> dogs are expensive, okay? Listen, listen, you know me? Dogs are so expensive.